yeah. I'm hoping everybody sees what I see. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, and especially for the comprehensive um, introduction, I guess you read my entire bio. I'll do my best to keep to time here. Um, and I'll start by just acknowledging, I, I live and work for the last seven and a half years uh, in the Adelaide Plains. Uh, and that means I live and work on Ghana country. Uh, and as is custom and tradition here in Australia, we acknowledge country um, of the traditional owners. I'll also be talking about um, uh, a region up in the Northwest uh, Pilbara of Western Australia uh, called Murajuga. And so we acknowledge um, uh, the traditional owners and uh, their elders uh, and respect their relationship with country. Um, I'm gonna give a, an overview on the Deep History of Sea Country project. It, it is um, a, a three year project formally. Uh, we're probably in the fifth year now, I suppose. Uh, and if you want to know more about it, the website deephistoryofseacountry.com has uh, kind of our, our long-standing blog. It's a complex project with quite a few institutions and quite a few people. Uh, I won't go through it in great detail here uh, as we're a bit pressed on time already. Um, but just to say that there, there are a lot of moving parts, uh, a lot of wonderful people, and a lot of wonderful students and early career um, people, especially research students. And we've been trying very hard to make sure that our students are publishing uh, and active in, um, in co-publishing with us as well as leading publications themselves. So um, uh, Helen gave a great introduction actually to Greater Sahul, um, the landmass that makes up now uh, what is Australia and New Guinea. Uh, and essentially this gives the, the, the backdrop um, of the type of field archeology span that the deep history of sea country uh, undertook from 2017 until recently. Um, certainly, it's not to say that we were the first to do uh, submerged landscape archaeology in Australia. Um, obviously, uh, in Nick Fleming and Pat Masters' 1983 volume, uh, Nick wrote about um, their work here in at the Kumanuga Shoals. Uh, also, others like Norman Tyndale were mentioning, um, you know, several decades ago, the potential. And we've had people such as Dave Nutley, who works in consulting archaeology here in Australia, who's been working in submerged archaeology and underwater cultural heritage, uh, wrote a really wonderful master's thesis um, uh, a few years back now on um, submerged archaeology. Um, Peter Veth and Charlie Dorch have both written on um, the potential for submerged archaeology in um, the Dampier Archipelago and uh, in the Pilbara region, as well as others. And Charlie Dorch's uh, son, Joe Dorch, along with my fellow colleague in CI, Joe McDonald, actually published uh, an intertidal site from the Dampier Archipelago uh, in the Journal of Island and Coastal Archaeology just in these past few years. So the study area that we're going to be talking about today is Murujuga, or the Dampier Archipelago in Western Australia. Um, Murujuga is uh, home to um, the traditional owners that make up the Murjug Aboriginal Corporation. And our project was very much designed to test a suite of perspective methods and evaluate land and seascape um, for the potential to identify submerged archaeology on the continental shelf. This is a bit closer up in terms of what the island group looks like. Um, and these are some of the areas which we eventually highlighted through our iterative process. And, and I've heard that term now used a few times um, in submerged landscape archaeology and in this particular conference. It, and, and ours was very much an iterative process of figuring out where the sites would have been originally before inundation, where the sites would be best preserved, and where archaeologists could pick up an archaeological signature, an anthropogenic deposit on the seabed. I won't go into the geology. I'm not a geologist. I'm a field archaeologist primarily. Um, uh, but, but the landscape looks a bit like this. And um, this is from Cape Brugere. Uh, this is a, an east facing uh, shot um, from the drone, which we flew all around the archipelago. And you can see um, some of the different um, geological units and uh, the type of landscape that we're working in here uh, in Murujuga. Uh, it's an incredibly tidal area, so we have in some cases four meters of tide. Uh, any diver who's uh, tuning in here knows that that can be quite challenging uh, for diving operations or snorkeling operations. You can get pulled through these little channels very easily. Uh, and it also has an impact on site location, site preservation, and so forth. So it's just a function of um, 
being aware of what we're what we're working with in this tropical environment. Uh, the types of uh, of archaeology that you get in in this area. This is um, uh, a, a crystalline rock called granifier. It, it breaks in a, a fairly uh, reliable way. It's not as nice as flint or chert, um, but it, it can produce a good cutting edge. And again, it can be um, fairly predictable. Uh, there's tons of rock art up in Murujuga, and my colleague Joe McDonald from UWA is the rock art specialist from that area. Um, there are literally millions of, of individual pieces of rock art in that landscape, and it is a highly significant um, uh, archaeological landscape that has been uh, occupied for at, at least 28,000 years. Um, the oldest Pleistocene site in that archipelago is from Murujuga Rock Shelter with a date of 28,000 BP. We also get these um, anthropogenic signatures in uh, stone arrangements or site furniture, if you will, in some cases. We don't know what these stone circles are in particular here, um, but we, we, we have these types of sites. So we started out through the iterative process by just mapping the seabed in any way that we could. Um, it, it was a, a project funded by the Australian Research Council to the tune of uh, just under 600,000 Australian dollars. So that's about 300,000 uh, Great British pounds. So it gives you a bit of an idea of the type of money that we had. It's uh, not insignificant, but also not the kind of money that you can um, uh, use to go out and hire uh, large scale marine survey vessels for days or, or for weeks on end. But we were fortunate enough to be working with some uh, wonderful people here at Flinders University and, and the Airborne Research Australia group who flew um, the small survey plane um, with both a red and a green LIDAR. So if anyone's ever done any uh, airborne uh, topobathymetric or um, um, uh, airborne based LIDAR, uh, they know that this is highly technical. There are good days and bad days like any remote sensing techniques. Um, but we were very fortunate that we had a good outcome with um, Jorg and Shakti who flew in that tiny little plane all around the archipelago and, and over the span of I think it was 10 days and two trips of, of flying, they collected um, several hundred line kilometers of um, both red uh, topographic and green bathymetric LIDAR. And, and this is kind of what you're looking at. Here's um, an image of Rosemary Island where the red is terrestrial, the, the lighter peach colors and the yellows are, are intertidal. Uh, some of the coral um, deposits you can see there and actually, um, and the blue is, is bathymetric. We got down to about 10 or 11 meters really cleanly and you can see some of the sand waves um, and some of the identifiable features in kind of the lighter colors there. Those are fully submerged. Uh, here is a nice, um, uh, what, we're, what we affectionately call the causeway between Enderby Island and, and Goodwood Island. Um, obviously two uh, totally distinct islands, but when you, when you pick it up in the Bathy LIDAR, you see that they were very well connected and actually had a nice sheltered bay. So um, this was one of our dive sites when we started eventually diving because we thought this would be a highly prospective place that would have been sheltered um, during one of the post LGM inundation phases. Uh, in addition to the to the Bathy LIDAR, we um, went out with uh, our graduate students and there's Professor Jeff Bailey in the corner there. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Paul Bagley of Wessex Archaeology, who is a wonderful colleague of ours and also an adjunct um, lecturer in maritime archaeology here at Flinders. So Paul comes out uh, under normal years and normal circumstances every year and does a bit of teaching and a bit of research with us. Here we are with an edge tech um, high resolution uh, compact uh, side scan, Edge Tech 4125, uh, and we effectively went out and mapped some of the areas on the seabed that we thought would be um, useful um, to see if there were any targets for um, further investigation through diver-based means. And here's a couple of examples. Here's that causeway on the nautical chart and what it looked like on the side scan. Um, in the corner there, that's Dr. Mick O'Leary from UWA, and, and Mick was the principal geomorphologist and geologist on this project. Um, I have to say, Mick and I spent a lot of time in the field and we got to know each other pretty well. And um, I don't think I ever want to do a project um, on submerged landscapes without uh, an in-house geomorphologist because Mick was such a fantastic asset to the team and, and very much the co-director uh, of the project and the field work. And here we are um, at uh, Rolly Rock, which is um, just a, a rocky reef out in the outer islands, uh, looking to see if there were any types of sites that 
uh, potential sites where we might find uh, quarrying or lithic deposits or potentially even rock art. Um, basically put the drop cam down to see where there was sand, where there was um, stone and so forth. So we had an idea of again, where we could narrow down through the iterative process um, targets. We also took the opportunity while we were out there to do intertidal surveys around the island, um, around the archipelago, I should say. Um, and here is one of the, um, the, the first uh, quarry sites we found in the intertidal zone in 2018. And this was just um, while Mick and I were out there. Um, we thought we saw something interesting from the boat. We pulled up and, and just had a little walk around, uh, recorded everything with a GPS and a tape that we happen to have uh, available to us. But you can see at the bottom very clearly there, these are, um, these are quarried stones um, and this is that granifier material. Interestingly, it's, it's red um, because of the desert winds and the dust when it's um, completely dry, but the same rock is actually this color uh, gray in the intertidal zone where it's where it's um, uh, washed repeatedly. So you get the same type of stone, but it's just a different color based on where it is uh, on the landscape. So this is very clearly a quarry site. We don't know the age of these intertidal sites because of course they could be quarried at low tide, you know, in the last um, 50 years really. Uh, but there's also good likelihood that they're much older. So, you know, to be determined and here we are later, um, we came back in the following year in 2019 to actually look more carefully at that intertidal quarry. And um, there we are with uh, Dr. Maddie Fowler in the corner, who's a postdoc of Helen's up at, up at Southampton these days. Um, and in, um, on the right, you can see one of these um, stone tools, very clear platform, very clear um, uh, fracturing and scarring, uh, bubble percussion, uh, and so forth. So you can see the number of intertidal lithics that we recorded there. Again, we don't know the age of this. This is very much within the intertidal zone and it does dry out entirely at the low tide. Uh, we got in, uh, I am an underwater archeologist or I'm an archeologist who does employ diving and snorkeling techniques in my field work. Uh, here we are with the drone and with some of our uh, students and some of our um, colleagues doing a bit of snorkeling in the, um, uh, in the channel there. Um, we actually went and looked at some of the uh, rock shelters that were intertidal to see if they, we could find any archeology span in the rock shelters themselves. But this uh, rock shelter on Goodwin Island was quite scoured. Um, we did get a sea level index point though out of those um, uh, uh, oysters, which was, which was quite useful in the end to confirm the regional models were actually accurate. So here we are sending our students, our happy students into these rock shelters, um, safety first. So always wear a helmet when entering a rock shelter through, um, via snorkeling. Um, we did do some diving around the archipelago, which didn't turn up any archeology. span And I think anyone who's actually gone looking for site scale uh, underwater archeology span on submerged landscapes will tell you that, you know, we're looking for the haystacks. I think Jeff Bailey has said this in a recent interview, not just the needle, but we're looking for the haystacks. Um, and we did do a, a, a bit of diving in the third year before we actually found a site. Um, but this was the first site here at uh, Cape Rougier that, that produced confirmed subtitle archaeology. And what we have here is, is a, a beach rock terrace and in between um, uh, Cape Brugere or, or Brugere Island and North Gidley Island, um, we have uh, a, a channel that is just below the uh, the mean low watermark and it, it never dries out. So we, we took some um, uh, sea level measurement points while we were there as well. And this is what the um, Cape Brugere Channel site looks like uh, at high tide. Uh, and we targeted this area in part because we thought it would be highly prospective and good for preservation. Obviously preservation conditions are really critical at the site scale. Um, the divers who were sent down initially were uh, John McCarthy and Chelsea Wiseman, two PhD candidates at the time at Flinders University. Um, and there they are actually doing the initial diving on um, in Cape Rougier Channel. Uh, and John actually recorded, found and recorded the very first um, subtitle uh, uh, archaeology on the seabed there at Cape Rougier Channel. And so if you look at the top left, uh, the, the material is all covered in a fine sediment uh, that is basically the same color as the seabed. So as an underwater archaeologist, you're looking for shapes. You're looking for something that stands out. 
Um, and so once you see something that is slightly different or you get your eye in, so to speak, you, you, you dust it off, you clean it off and see what it is. Is it a piece of coral? Is it, is it stone? Uh, can it potentially be a worked stone uh, tool? And this is what we were training our students with uh, this technique uh, as we were going. And we did actually end up, well, the first year of the project, we did actually take a, a group of uh, PhD and MA students over to Denmark uh, to work with the Mosgard Museum and our wonderful colleagues, um, Mads Holst and Peter Mo Astra, as well as the, the, the late uh, Klaus Schriever, who helped us to train our early career uh, and, and PhD and MA students in underwater working and, and identification of materials. So that was of a huge value to us. And, and we, we very much learned from the Splash Cost community. Um, and because of that, and, and in part because of that, we were able to identify uh, submerged sites here during the DHSC project. So there you see a stone tool. This is a scraper, very clear marking, very clear retouch uh, along um, that edge there. This is uh, artifact A10. Uh, from the channel, uh, and you can see it's photographed next to a marine organism that lives below the intertidal zone. So that it, that is uh, very clearly in an area that never dries out, and and that was something that we were interested in because if it's if it's in the intertidal zone, we don't know how old it is. If it's below the intertidal zone, then that gives us a pretty good indication that we have a limiting date, at least when we had sea sea level stabilization in that in that area. Um, so we actually recorded um, almost 300 artifacts, uh, mostly in the subtitle part of Cape Brugier Channel, um, a few in the intertidal zone as well, um, which, which does dry out because we have those four meter, meter tidal um, swings. Um, and here you can see a few examples of the different artifacts from the subtitle area. We have scrapers, knives, um, a few different core tools, possibly a core axe. Ken Mulvaney said that he looked at A23 and said, that's an axe. Um, I, I don't have enough familiarity or expertise in uh, Aboriginal stone tool technology, but certainly we could tell there are um, you know, multi-platform cores here. Uh, there are what I would have called sort of a palm scraper. Um, perhaps a knife, if, if, that, if that is a term that would be accepted, but there, there are better terms by, used by lithic specialists, I'm sure. A40 is a really interesting one because it's very clearly uh, a muller or a grindstone uh, used probably for uh, processing seeds uh, as food. So we have all kinds of different tools used for all kinds of different purposes. Um, cutting, scraping, chopping, and seed grinding here in the um, subtitle. And here they are done in kind of a neat 3D uh, modeling technique that John did for us just for illustrative purposes. But you can really get an idea very clearly um, that these are absolutely 100 percent, you know, artifacts. Um, they're covered in, in marine growth. They're mostly sitting under the low water mark um, and in a context that never dries out. So that's that was quite exciting, of course, for the team when we identified this site. I, I was, uh, as an archaeologist, not really sure how all of this material got there and what the different uh, possibilities were for deposition. And of course, we, would, we knew we would be scrutinized by the community. So Mick O'Leary, our geomorphologist, um, and I sat down and started asking all of the questions. Um, you know, are these in situ? Are these redeposited? Is this a lag deposit? And we went through all the various hypotheses. And I won't read through it all, but Essentially, we don't have size sorting in a way that would indicate um, a redeposition. Um, we have even distribution over a large area, varying depths with no real patterning consistent of the action of tidal current or waves. We don't have rolling. Uh, so if you see A20, A23, A29, A11, they all have sharp edges. Um, whereas the Goodwin Cave artifact that we found, well, we're calling it an artifact here, I suppose, but it's really only a potential artifact. Um, those types of artifacts in these highly rolled environments look like GC1, um, so probably moving around quite a little bit, quite, quite a lot, whereas um, the, art, the artifacts that we found haven't really moved around much at all. There's no damage consistent with fluvial transport or any kind of rolling in, in the waves. Um, they're also quite large compared to what we're seeing locally on land. Um, there's a larger size, which typically in the Pilbara um, region, we get larger equals older. That's, that's kind of the established typology, although there's no real typological, um, you know, perfect um, 
typological way of identifying age with artifacts here. But one of the honors students at UWA, Patrick Morrison, uh, ran a, a depth versus artifact size uh, and found no, uh, no significant correlation in the artifact size and depth for underwater site or the underwater material. Uh, but the underwater material seemed to be quite a bit, you know, chunkier broadly than the stuff that was on shore. Uh, I asked Mick, you know, what about lag deposits? Could this stuff have just kind of eroded in, you know, the allochthonous nature of um, submerged sites? Uh, and and it, he really didn't think that was the case. And we went through all of the different geomorphic evidence and processes. Um, so we eventually got to the point where we decided that the, these have to be, you know, the simplest solution here is that these are probably in situ. And how can we identify the ages? I, I see Helen, which means I only have a few minutes. So I'm going to have to whip through the, the next few slides in, in a short period of time. We went about trying to identify the age of the seabed first so we could get a limiting day. And we found that the seabed on which these were sitting, these artifacts, was quite old. It gave us a kind of a weird um, set of dates though, Pleistocene dates. So why would there be a, a Pleistocene date of 30 to 40,000 years when we know that the seabed was not there 30 to 40,000 years ago. It was, it was several uh, tens or even hundreds of kilometers offshore. So we interpreted this as being a Pleistocene uh, seabed that was probably deposited at MIS-5E, the last time there was seabed there. Uh, we also went around um, the area to, to determine whether or not we thought that these artifacts could have been impacted by cyclone. And we were, I suppose the, the word would be fortunate enough that between the two visits to this site in 2018 and 2019, we actually recorded pre and post cyclone impacts on the marine terrace there. Uh, and we found that there was actually very little movement in, um, in the material on shore, just in the, um, at the top of the intertidal zone by uh, what was a category four cyclone. So we didn't think that it was too impacted by the cyclones and we didn't see any evidence on um, the archaeology itself. And I'll be quick here, Helen, I'll, I'll go through quite quickly. The second site that I'll report really is just a fine spot. Um, Mick was very keen that we dive these um, wonky holes or submerged, uh, what, what turns out to be submerged freshwater springs underwater at about 15 meters. And here they are in, in some multi-beam and side scan data that um, the multi-beam was collected for us by industry, the side scan data we collected ourselves. And there's Chelsea diving on this, um, uh, this wonky hole or this, this feature. Um, there is my MA student, Jerem, who eventually found um, one really nice uh, retouched blade. Uh, and so we're calling this a site that would have been um, uh, inundated about eight and a half thousand years ago. So whereas we think that the site at Cape Brugere's was inundated about 7,000 years ago, the Brugere site must be at least 7,000. We don't have a better age for that. We don't have a better age for, for the uh, flying foam passage site than eight and a half thousand. These are both limiting dates, um, but you know, they were still very, very happy in Murujuga. Uh, we work with traditional owners. We, we, we liaised with and, and collaborated with the traditional owners every step of the way. And we were very much in touch with them every single time we went out into the field. And they were absolutely delighted, which um, if Helen says that, you know, the community approach is the necessary approach and is the right approach, we completely agree with that. And we were working in, hand in hand with the Merger Aboriginal Corporation, who were absolutely thrilled to be able to announce, you know, at artifacts that date back to over or at least eight and a half thousand years on the seabed. Um, it, 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 it hit the news and some of you may have seen some of this, that it was in a few different papers around the world, but we estimate about 5 million people would have seen this. And it's also had an impact on what, um, what people are going to, to consider now here in terms of offshore development and, um, uh, what, what they're calling, what Reuters called a new indigenous underwater cultural heritage test. Um, this is, I think, my last slide, Helen. So what do we need here in Australia? Well, we're establishing a subdiscipline within a subdiscipline, essentially. We have to understand the opportunities and limitations and accept that this is a long-term process. And I like that Jeff said earlier, this is about a 55-year uh, plan. Um, public, public policies need to be reviewed. Jeff was right. There are uh, policy mechanisms and, and legislation that, that do protect underwater cultural heritage of indigenous sites, especially state and territorial level policies. But the national commonwealth law here for underwater cultural heritage protection 
does favor um, shipwrecks uh, as opposed to all sites, which would be consistent with the UNESCO convention. So we do have some work to do there. We need partnerships just like in Europe, universities, communities, industry, government. And of course, there is the, the issue here that, that you don't so much face in Europe with um, the impacts of colonialism and traditional ownership. Finally, the communities here need to come out of the silos. Maritime archaeology needs to consider deep time and indigenous archaeology needs to get in the sea. If you want to read more, deephistoryofseacountry.com has it all. The plus one paper and the questionnaire international paper are now out and there's a nice little video there on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It's great to see some actual archaeology after all that seismic and survey data. And it's good to see people actually in the water as well. So thank you. Um, we do have a question. Um, so we've got a question from Trevor Faulkner. Uh, he says he's interested in the spring at minus 14 metres. Is it from a limestone aquifer? Is the inland recharge point known? Oh, you're on mute. Aquifer. There you go. <laughs> Try again. Sorry. Yeah. Could you hear me there, Helen? No, but I can now. Okay. Um, I think I think that's it. It is it is uh, of some sort of uh, you know a, a freshwater uh, limestone system there. I think, um, but I don't know where the in, the inland recharge point would be. No, I don't know the answer to that. I know that what we're looking at now in terms of these submerged freshwater springs, they're all around Australia. And in fact, if you Google wonky holes and um, fishing sites, you'll see some really interesting um, sport fishing going on in places all around the north of Australia. Queenslanders like to go and fish there because there's, there's good um, fishing uh, due to the increased, um, uh, I guess, ecological um, uh, aspects of, of having fresh water interact with marine water. So this is something we can actually do by, by doing what the Danes did in the 1970s and 80s, go and speak to fishers and ask them, you know, where their fishing spots are and maybe go run some multi beam some side scan and then dive those sites and see if there's more archaeology in them. We certainly know that there are more um, wonky holes in Flying Foam Passage that we haven't yet dived. So Hopefully we'll get some uh, renewed funding from the Australian Research Council or other mechanisms to go out and actually explore some of these other targets that we haven't gotten to yet. Of course, that last site was found, as all archaeologists will tell you, on the last dive of the last day, uh, which is why we only have one really nice artifact from that second site. But that, that is just um, Murphy's Law, I suppose. Yeah. So much, so much potential there, and um, it's brilliant to see it as well. And the coverage as well was brilliant for the, the discipline of submerged archaeology. Um, I know it's getting late for you, and we need to move on um, as well to Gary Momba. Um, we just have one little uh, comment from Rachel. She said, please, could you give, oh, you've already done it, the website address. So the website address it's, it's, is in the comments. Yeah, it's just www.deephistoryofseacountry.com. Uh, there's also a Twitter handle called at Deep Sea Country. Uh, and if you really can't find it, just Google my name and Flinders and you'll you'll eventually get there or you can send me an email and I'll be happy to share that with Danielle and, and the society. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks Thank everyone for listening and for having me. Thank you, Helen.